really quick before the show starts, in case you haven't heard, we have a growing community of investors called the Scale Community, which is full of people learning to make massive income with their real estate businesses so they can reach financial freedom a little bit faster than building a rental portfolio solely over time, because honestly, that takes decades and who has time for that? So if you're an investor who is serious about growing and creating a scalable business without needing to be a slave to it 24-7, then go to collectingkeys.com slash scale and apply. And if you're a good fit, we would love to have you join the community. So again, collectingkeys.com slash scale, go ahead and apply and we'll see if you're a good fit. With what I expect the market to do over the next five to 10 years, it is highly possible that anyone that's holding for quote unquote appreciation Just the net sum total is going to cost to maintain the property and have your turnover and throw the new roof on and and do all these things is going to be more than the actual appreciation on a lot of houses. What's going on, guys? Welcome to today's episode of the Collecting Geese Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today is Wednesday. It's the off-market operator radio show. And this is the show where we talk about making massive income, not just passive income with your real estate investing business. If this is your first time here, I am Mike DeHaan here with my co-host, Dan Austin and Dylan Cook. And uh, on these Wednesday shows, we like to talk about real estate investing, business, and whatever else we feel like for the week. And so we are here going into, I guess at this point, halfway into the first month of Q4. And uh, we were chatting before the show about our rental portfolios. And we all have the same interesting situation of like, if you look at the top line of our rental portfolios, we're all doing pretty dang well. So uh, like Dylan, you said that you have done about $300,000 gross on your rentals. I pulled up Dan and I's numbers. And if you include stuff that Dan and I joined on together and my private ones, about $45,000 a month gross. And yet none of us are actually taking home any money. And like, why is that? <laughs> you guys are? No. You guys aren't making money? Dan's been collecting rent at the doorsteps. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> cash, cash, baby. He's been embezzling it. But no, it's this, it's this phenomenon though that... I don't want to say it's like unique for like right now. I just feel like that a lot of us that have only been in the game for like five years, maybe this is our first exposure to it of you have all this money that comes in, but after mortgages, which everyone understands, right? But the increases in taxes and just maintaining the properties and the actual true expense to repair all the stuff you're supposed to repair. It's actually really freaking hard to like make actual money with a rental portfolio. And what's the point? I guess. I don't know. Is there a point? There's a point, right? There's a point. I think the the main difference I would want to get across is if I look at my rental portfolio on like a underwriting perspective, like, you know, on paper, taking the ghost expenses off, we should make, I don't know, eight, nine thousand dollars a month in net cash flow. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the year, you're like, okay, you made ten thousand dollars the entire year. So where the hell did the money go? And a lot of that is CapEx and repairs and this shit that pops up during yeah. your length of ownership. Yeah. Do you think you could cull the herd, as they say, and like have like a really tight, strong cash flowing portfolio that would get you to like 8000 a month if you sold off a bunch of shit? I think going that route, would basically be like selling everything, recapturing the equity and 1031 ing into probably like a triple net or okay. like something like a commercial deal that would just be net on net. So you don't have like the gems, the, like the stars of your portfolio and then the dogs that are dragging you down. Because like Mike and I have kind of that, like we yeah. have a dichotomy in our portfolio. There are two properties, my two four units that are right next to each other that I freaking love. Yeah. They kill it. And they, there's room to go up on those two, but like mm-hmm. a lot, like as far as rent income yeah. goes. But so yeah, I could guess sell off some of the beaters and just reinvest and pay those off. But. Yeah. Yeah. There's a valid point though, Dan, because I guess if you only took like our handful of really strong properties, it would make money, but they are dragged down by the rest of the ones in the portfolio that do have recurring issues for whatever reason. Totally right. It's like shit that you can't even freaking guess is going to happen. Well, the funny thing is too, is it's not even like it's neighborhood related or it's like it's always the bad tenants. Because I got one of our best portfolio duplexes in the worst part of town. Yeah, our first right. tenant, Mike, I just got a call. You remember Adam? Schmadam, um, that lived in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're moving out. Like, this is our, this is a good story. This is how the, Mike and I are great people. So, we buy this duplex, our first property we bought together, right? I mean, this is the first property we actually truly bought as an off market deal that also almost sunk us because we bought it way too early. <laughs> this is the iconic property that almost sunk the, the Mike and Dan story that never would have been. 
And we remodeled this thing. Beautiful. After the tenants, the current tenants moved out. And when was that? 2020? That was 2020. No point to that story, but I just wanted to bring that up. Well, we print money in that property, right? We print money on that property. We do. And, you know, a big part of it is we bought it at such a good discount. We added value to it. You know, it's prices have gone up, right? Rents have gone up and everything else. But then we also own things that are in like A class neighborhoods that on paper look like much better assets. And we just lose our ass on them constantly. Yeah. Right. That's just Murphy's law too. Sometimes we've had that basement on our beautiful A class property and the best part of Spokane that's flooded four times now, all for different yeah. reasons. You would think, okay, it flooded four times, fix your problem, dude. No, it's for all different reasons. This like stuff you can't even control. And that's an extreme example. But even my own personal rentals, I have two that are literally in the best neighborhood in North Spokane. And the problem with those ones is because they are in an A-class area where I have a higher rental rate and I get higher income earning tenants, the churn is significantly higher. I've owned the properties for six years and I have had six different tenants in each one. Mm -hmm. And every time that happens, there's a month of vacancy. There's always shit that needs to be fixed. There's random odds and ends. Plus those properties have appreciated a ton. So my taxes have increased an ungodly amount. Yep. Yep. And all of a sudden, I'm not making any money with these things, right? And honestly, I just got lucky where I have huge gains just because I bought them before the market went stupid. I will say the caveat to this conversation for me personally is my student rentals are kicking ass right now. I bet. And I think I, think I still have room to grow on rents and I really increased the rents quite a bit on those. But you also bought those a long time ago. Yeah. You bought those in 2016 and 20, what, 18? Yeah, about then, yeah. Yeah, I did buy them a long time ago. Did you refinance them all since then? I have. I refinanced at a 3% rates. Jesus. What was that two years ago? Into like five and a half or six percent rates, which my cash flow kind of dipped a little bit because then taxes and everything went up too. And I was like, Yeah, but what you, I'm sure you cashed out a decent amount from those. Yeah, I cashed out like, what was it like, sort of like around close to 300,000 or something like that out of the yeah, two of them. Yeah, that's worth more than the cash flow for how many years, right? And that's why I did it because then I was yeah. able to make a ton off of that money. But then rents in that market jumped up really quickly. And, and that is not, typical of the Spokane market. It's like we're almost like a step function. Like we're always getting a premium as a student rental, but then it kind of flattened out because I think a bunch of people came into the market to be landlords mm -hmm. and then finally realized, oh, this is not making money. So then we stepped up another like 500 bucks a month, which is huge for my cash flow. However, I know enough to know that I don't get to spend that cash flow because there is a looming CapEx, definitely on one of them, at least one or two CapEx items that are going to kill me, you know, in the next five years at some point. So that the so two things. One is, I mean, 80% of my calls are plumbing related or water related, I should say. So if you're a new investor, update the plumbing. I don't care if yeah. it costs more. Always do that. Yeah. Second thing is, I guess the question is, okay, like Mike was getting to this selling is, or do you have enough room to cash out refinance, still be cash flow positive? And now that, that money that you're bringing in from that, that's tax free. You're not even that's that yeah. tax free money. Totally. Yes. But then the, the problem is, is like how much cash are you giving up? Because your cash flow is ultimately your insurance on these things. Yeah. You're not actually having yes. to spend that money to fix things up. Because the only reason that our rentals aren't a big loss and are just like a basically a break even for the year is because we have that cash flow. Yes. Yep. Right. And so we could do another cash out refinance on some of these and get a higher interest rate and have no cash flow, especially because there are lenders right now that are advertising they'll do a less than one uh, DSCR. DSCR, loan, which is crazy right? to me. But yeah, I mean, it's just what they're willing to do, I guess. But then okay. like, you're going to literally be losing on that. Yeah, which is scary, by the way. And that's not good to do. No, but one of the, the things that does make me kind of wonder about the, I would say the like middle-ish term, I'll say long, long term, but like middle-ish term, uh, value of rental properties is I do really think that just with what I expect the market to do over the next five to 10 years, that it is highly possible that anyone that's holding for quote unquote appreciation, just the net sum total is going to cost to maintain the property and have your turnover and throw the new roof on in 10 years and do all these things is going to be more than the actual appreciation on a lot of houses. Like think about it, right? If you have a $300,000 house right now, it's going to grow 10% over the next five years. It's going to increase by 30 grand. There's a pretty good chance that you're going to have to spend $30,000 just to keep that property not shitty over those five years. Right? It's only six grand a year for yeah. each one. And if you have like one major item that comes up, which if you live anywhere with weather, Florida, you have tenant turnover. That's going to happen, right? You know, I have to replace the HVAC, the air conditioning, the roof, 
whatever it is, you know, throw some new paint on the outside. Each of those items will cost six thousand dollars or more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, things aren't yep. things aren't cheap. Yeah, for the forever investor, I guess they could refinance, take out their fifty year and the refinance, do those capex items, so they get another five to ten years and just have their money parked in real estate. But that's going back to an opportunity cost, like, or could you just take that money and reinvest it at a higher return somewhere else? You could. And I would say for the forever investor, all they're doing is they are taking their future problems and they're ignoring them. So they can do whatever they want to do right now. Or the caveat being to that, I guess, would be is like you want to diversify your capital, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're just chasing ROI, you're never going to really truly diversify unless you're actually like diversifying your ROI, right? Because like if I should have been invested in Bitcoin, like old dill pill over here, you Hmm. know, like... Yeah, but how many are like even GoBundance guys, how many of like... Most of the people who are in that group, 80% plus are probably in there because of real estate. And they're one-trick ponies, though. Yeah. Well, they, they got their wealth because of real estate. Yeah, they are one-trick yeah, they ponies. Yeah, like, not many of them have any kind of traditional you know, stock portfolios, crypto portfolios, no. whatever it may be. They're just like, I'm real estate and that's it. Yep. Yeah. Which I don't think is a great idea at all. No, I don't think so either. You always look back and be like, well, I'm glad I own this asset. But you might have been more glad to own a different asset when you're talking to your buddy who bought something else at that t- same over that same time period that had a much higher ROI. Totally. So if I'm looking at like residential real estate, I think that the way if you're like a serious investor slash real estate entrepreneur, or you're someone that like wants to figure out the max value for your money, what the play really should be is you buy it at a heavy discount on day one and you create some value, you know, so you can like burr refinance out as much of your money as you can. You keep it as a rental property for the lifetime of the renovation that you did, right? Which will probably be relatively short since you probably did a cheaper renovation like most landlords do. And then once you get to like that four to seven year standpoint, you look to sell them and pass it on to the next guy because that is, then it can become their problem. They can become their value add opportunity, right? Yeah. And then you can realize your gains cash out on that equity that you forced when you bought at that discount and move it on to something else where you get a better return. Are you in that theoretical situation? Are you 1031ing those proceeds into something else? Or are you just paying the taxes and trying to redeploy that capital somewhere else? I think that depends. This is something from my accountant when I tried to 1031 last year and I was about to buy a deal that was super mediocre and I'm really glad that I didn't in hindsight. Yep. And my accountant was like, hey, dude, I, was like, I honestly recommend instead of buying that deal, just pay the taxes. He's like, I can't tell you how many investors I've worked with that have bought a shitty deal with doing 1031 trying to not pay taxes and end up losing more money. Yeah, then they would have saved just from paying the freaking taxes. Yeah, totally. And what people don't realize too, like if you 1031 a, a small property and you keep keep doing that, that final property, I don't care how much equity you have, you you have so much tax like build up there that you're you're going to be upside down. You basically have to die so your kids don't pay the tax. Yes. I mean, that's the play at that point in time. Like you don't personally necessarily get any benefit off of that. That's the whole 1031 until you die kind of concept, I guess. Totally. Well, also too, I think something that people tend to ignore when they do 1031s is what the actual cost is to transact real estate on both sides. The transactional cost. So like when I went and I was going to do my 1031, once I got into all the costs to sell the property that I sell the properties that I sold and buy the properties I was going to buy with the loan costs and all the other just like bullshit that was involved in it, it ultimately came around to the point that I was going to be like only saving like 12 grand, right? <laughs> yeah. Versus if I had just paid the taxes, it was like a 60... Go wholesale deal. Yeah, it was like $60,000 in taxes I was trying to avoid. And instead I was going to be not really saving that much at all. And so I was like, well, I might as well just take the money. Which, I mean, 60 grand taxes sounds terrible, but when you get down to it, it's not that bad once you have no. all the sales costs, all the buying costs, the risk of buying a shitty deal, all the 1031 costs, because it's not free to do a 1031 exchange. You know what I mean? And the headache <laughs> of doing it. Sometimes just paying the taxes. That's what I'm trying to figure out. I did 1031 one of my single families into my 13 unit. I'm trying to look up real quick what it costs to do it. I don't know. It was a couple of grand, I think. The actual yeah. 1031 itself isn't that bad. It's me getting like the loan cost and everything else, but you're doing the DSCR loan and then you're doing the inspection. And Oh, yeah. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yep. They charge two points, just origination fees, just to do the freaking loan. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Just dumb stuff. So anyways, I don't know. It's just, I think that the big lesson, I, I did a whole episode on my YouTube and a previous Friday folks around this, around like how I'm planning to sell my rentals. I think, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. Just make sure that you actually know what your returns are, you know? And, mm-hmm. and other people are talking about this too. Like, it, it's funny. I was saying to Dylan before we hopped on, 
Brandon Turner did a post on his Instagram, it's like yesterday, talking about how you never really get real cash flow on rental on residential rental properties because you know if you're doing three dollars a month, there's eventually going to be a three thousand dollar thing you're going to have to pay for. Mm-hmm. And the thing that was so funny to me was his post is one hundred percent accurate. He was getting shredded by people in the comments that are like, "Well, then why did you spend a decade telling people to buy properties?" Then it's like, "Well, because 2024 is very different than 2014 when he started making real estate content." Yeah. And totally, and when when he only needed three thousand dollars a month in cash flow to survive, that was probably fine, right? Like exactly. When yeah. your mindset changes too, and, and it's just the reality of the situation. Like buying real estate for long term rental properties is always an option, but you really have to know why you're doing. It. Mm-hmm. Like, what is your ultimate goal? Because if you're listening, listening to the people, make sure you know who you're listening to that are saying go buy rental properties. Like, why are they saying that? And does that actually apply to you? And what are they actually getting? Because I mean, I mean, we all started here buying rental properties, and we, Dylan, you're still buying rental properties. I don't think Mike and I have bought. Have we bought a buy and hold recently? Like last year no. or two? I don't think we have. We sold more than we have purchased for sure. And I think it just you have to understand what you're shooting for, what you're going for, and if you want a diversified place to put some money, I think real estate is still a great place. You do get the tax benefits or some other great things, some leverage and all that stuff. But like, if you're thinking cash flow is your play or it's going to take over some shit, that's not at all the right thing to do. And the last thing I, I probably want to say on this is there's gurus out there and uh, people who I guess we know probably a little bit personally that who are trying to sell you a turnkey deal or trying to sell you a deal. Mm-hmm. They'll include like that depreciation and the principal pay down in their ROI metrics. And just know that's not how you, you should calculate that. Your no. ROI is going to be much lower with those two pieces of information and in yeah. the input side of that equation. Exactly. Well, and I think the reason people get into rental properties, though, is typically because they're, you know, some kind of white collar employee that feels like if they buy all these assets, they're not going to have to work as hard. <laughs> but a lot of us know as you get into this game, I mean, it's significantly more work than you ever expected when you got into it. The problem is you see all these, you know, dorks on Instagram or whatever who talk about how they used their rental properties to like retire and move to Dubai, which I'm, don't know why it's always fucking Dubai. Sounds incredibly hard to do. I don't know that you can do that. Dubai has like <laughs> one of the highest like annual incomes of any country in the world. So there's this whole thing right now that I am certain we're going in a whole different direction. I was expecting to go with this. Sorry to distract us. I knew where you would want to go. With the Dubai thing, I am convinced that the leaders, fuck, kings, yeah. whatever, of yeah, yeah. Dubai <laughs> are currently... United Arab Emirates. There's several. There's several. Eberts, did you know that? But Dubai specifically, <laughs> whichever ones, whichever whichever ones lead there. No, I know, I know. I get what you're saying. I'm pretty sure that they have hired influencers to talk about like their new lives that they are making in Dubai oh, to sure. try and get people to move there. Because yeah. there's so many like random like C and D list fucking influencers yeah. that are like all of a sudden like moving there and are just posting about it constantly. And I'm like, okay, guys, really? Just like yeah. one day you were like, man, what if I could have slaves and hit women and not go to jail? Let's move here. <laughs> Like, well, dude, it I mean, doesn't make any sense. Or you're just a really attractive woman wearing like 10% clothing. That's the only other piece that's over there. Yeah. Well, yeah, because they're, they're bought, dude, to be there. Like, they're yeah. there to hang out with the yeah. princess. Well, it's like all this stuff that the Middle East is paying for, right? Like, even Saudi Arabia is in this game, right? They're, you know, yeah. buying live golf, all this sort of stuff, all the sports. Like, they're really trying to pump it up, dude. And now they're buying the, like, real estate influencers to go and, and move there. Yeah. You know who I saw recently, which is so random, was... Uh, oh. Oh, Nick Sanitatastio. Yeah, yeah, the one that the one that Steve brought out to the meetup yeah. that we did. Don't say anything bad about him, Mike. Hey, he was a super nice guy, right? He, was, he has actually. a little thing. If you guys can go look him up. But he, like, recently moved there. And he has, like, this whole thing. And he's just constantly posting about his new life that he found there. I guarantee he's going to pay to do that. Absolutely. He's 100% the guy that would get bought yeah. to go and do that because all of a yeah. sudden his speeches are less impactful because he no longer works with Tony Robbins. I mean, let's be honest. Like Dubai's got some cool shit, but it's not Does America. It? It's not America. No, it's got some like cool buildings and stuff. Yeah, didn't they control the weather or some shit? They try to because they have to because <laughs> it's too hot there. Like nobody's willingly moving from America that, that has like a good established life in America to Dubai full time. Based on Instagram, you're wrong, Dan. I gotta say, shut up, dude. Like, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, like, I don't know. The, going back to the rental property thing, though, I think people get into that because they have this illusion that if they get into real estate, they're not gonna have to work as hard. They're gonna be able to spend more time with their kids and all that sort of stuff, which can absolutely be true. But that's after you get rich. 
It's not during like the grind phase when you get yeah. your five thousand dollar a month cash flow, which is what everyone says their goal is when they come and they join scale. And then all of a sudden they get to that and they're like, "Oh shit, I'm actually still poor because it's not as much money as I thought it was going to yeah. be." Yeah, that's not as much, not enough money. And if you don't have reserves, like you're screwed. Yeah. If anything yep. we just talked about the past thirty minutes comes up, yeah, I know. So yeah. It's it's a weird thing. I mean, I think that now more than ever, it's important that if you want any level of success is you have to approach your finances like a business owner, right? And from like a mature level. Well, yeah. Just like the level of financial intelligence out there is so much higher and you're competing with all those people. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? Yep. So going back to the point though we were making earlier is like, and realize it's going to be a lot of hard work. Like... There's a lot of people that started their own brick and mortar businesses and they'll tell you, you know, and maybe they're 67 years old now and all the hard work and the sleepless nights that they had, it's not really that any different just because of Instagram influencer got you to sign up for, the, for you know, wholesaling and off-market real estate. Like it's freaking hard work. And I don't, I think people underestimate the amount of hard work it takes. There are things in life that, for example, pharmacy school is a good example of this. If halfway through, if I would have known how hard it was, I don't know if I would have signed up at the beginning. Honestly, starting this wholesale like business is like similar to that. If you, because you don't know how much energy and time it is actually needed to start this thing. Once you're established, it's a little bit better. You're like, man, I'm proud of myself. I'm glad I did that. But it's freaking hard. Yep. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's funny, especially a couple of years ago when we were first starting to make the podcast and stuff, people would always ask like how we grew so quickly. And the honest truth, which sounds like such a baby boomer answer, is we worked for 12 to 14 hours a day pretty much every single day for like three years. Yeah, And then it finally came together. Like, I can't tell you how many conversations Dan and I have had via Slack at like 9.30 p.m. on a fucking Saturday. Yeah. Yep. Right? Like, that's just part of the game. Yeah. Yep. And if you, yeah, if you got to like the game a little bit, right? You can't just like think you want to show up and you want this like lifestyle business where you can sit at a computer and just make money. That's not how it works. You yeah. Know? Yeah. You know, if you want that, go and find the next MLM and try to be at the top and you can build your downline and then you could just con a bunch of people into paying your bills. Right. Did I ever tell you guys <laughs> one of the very first meetups I went to? This has been like 2017, 2018. I was talking to an older guy there simply because I was like, oh, he's old. He probably owns a bunch of properties. And he's like, oh, I've been coming to this thing for like 20 years. I'm like, oh, how many, you know, how much do you own? He's like, oh, I'm still waiting for the first one. Oh. And I'm just like, <laughs> and I was like, okay. Never oh saw, my like, God. That's pretty intense. And yeah, I don't know if he blamed his wife or something. I'm like, oh my God. Like, yeah, how much information do you think you actually need before you actually just pull the freaking trigger? No shit. If he would have just saved a dollar a day. Anything he would have bought 20 years ago would have been worth quadruple the amount. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's funny. I hope you guys are enjoying this episode. We are seriously trying to grow this podcast so that the voice of what it really takes to grow a real estate business becomes kind of the norm versus the guru get rich quick BS that everyone is fed on a daily basis. With so many podcasts out there, it is hard for us to get discovered on our own. So a quick ask, please share this episode on your social media accounts, be that a real story, whatever. And if you tag me at Mike underscore invest, then I will give you a follow and I will also send you a DM so that we can have a little chat about your business and any ways I could potentially help you grow. So again, please share it on your socials. Tag me at Mike underscore invests. That's with an S at the end. And I'll follow you and we can have a little DM, a combo about your business. And maybe I can help you grow a little bit or you could just say what's up to you. That'd be awesome. But appreciate everyone. And thanks so much for helping us grow. I remember the first meetup I ever went to here. It was run by a guy named Chris McIntosh. Oh, remember old Chris? Oh, yeah, dude. Literal criminal. You can yeah. go and give him a Google. But basically, his entire thing was him pitching newbies into giving him money to do deals. And then he would just not actually do the deal and just steal their money. <laughs> yeah. And that was like, you, like even back then, though, like there was still some of that like creepy guru shit going oh, on yeah. in like meetups. I think Bigger Pockets actually did a good job of turning the tide on that by like having people start their own bigger pockets type meetups. It just changed that. But yeah, before it was like, well, let me go pay this guru, give him my credit card and he'll figure it out. And like he, that dude was doing like one-on-one coaching like in his house, like in the evenings. It's like, this is getting real weird. Yeah. He's a, he There's a, a guy weirdo. in Cleveland who I guess would do the same thing, but he had like 19 deeds to one property or something. Like he tried nice. to secure 19 mortgages against one oh, property. Oh, yeah. I remember reading about this. This was like somewhat recent, like in the past couple of years. Yeah, it was. Mm-hmm. But then he has, has Instagram at courtside seats to like NBA games. Oh, I, yeah. I forget yeah. his name. I'll have to look it up. But I remember that. I did like a whole uh, like little Instagram series on like... It was just stealing people's money. Yeah, back in uh, 22 when the things first started to get weird, I was like obsessed with a lot of these scams. 
that people were doing because they like were all coming out of the woodwork. This is the same as when uh, Mike's like, "How do I do this?" No, <laughs> no, <laughs> I, like Google how to get nineteen deeds on properties. No, the thing that it was always fascinating to me about a lot of these was. A, there would be, there's always the ones that you're like, oh shit, I didn't know that guy was a crook. Yeah. Like, yeah. especially in Go Bundance, there was a few guys that came yeah, out that like, had been damn. robbing people for like a decade. But then also, too, there were so many other ones that I was like, I can't believe people believed this person. <laughs> right. You're like, yeah. right. It was, yeah. it was like my yeah. reality TV, dude. It was like my, you know, real estate Kardashians, where I'd be like, someone gave this person $70,000. Gross. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. There was some of them that were getting out of hand crazy. Like ultimately, it just came down to the old sort of adage, right? That if something feels too good to be true, it probably it is. It definitely is. And everyone's heard that. Everyone knows that. But for some reason... You get sucked in, man. People get sucked in. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Well... Yeah. Did you find him, Dylan? I tried. Now, I, Stephen Dedelbeck is a guy listed on this one, but this is from 2011. So this can't yeah. be right. Well, so the guy, he was like a DJ or something. And that's why it like blew up was because he was using these different influencers... And like the local uh, radio and stuff to to bring in all these investors. You know, it's funny. It's like we talk about um, Hormozy on this podcast and I, connecting the dots, I've heard Hormozy talk about him investing money with a guy from like a Cleveland house. And I wonder if it's the same dude. And he had, he said he lost like 50 grand. It might be. Probably. Yeah. Well, Alex Hormozy is dumb for believing in him. <laughs> right. Well, that, yeah. He's the first person to say that though too. He's right. like, I didn't yeah. know what I was doing. Yeah. Got out, of, got out of his skis on a different asset. Yeah. And that would turn into this whole pitch. Like, I'm only going to invest what I know. Yeah. You know, what I know, yeah. which is private equity businesses now. There's that one episode he talks about that specifically. And he has this line, which I really resonate with. And I feel like it's lost in the real estate world. He's like, and then I found out after I'd owned it for a month that apparently the tenants didn't have electricity or running water. And so I, I spent $30,000 to add that because of course they fucking should have running water. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. seriously. You know what I mean, it's optional. Well, cool. Well, I mean, we just talked about rentals for a while. I have a deal under contract that has like basically like three different exit strategies. One, I could keep them and or I could probably assign it, double close it, make like 20, 25 or take it down for like 20, 25 into it and um, probably make around 75K. So with that as like the top line, I don't know, scenario, what would you guys do with that? I would take that one down. I'd flip it. I mean, with those with those numbers... So this is like our new criteria, I guess, that we've put into our stuff and since we've been working with Cody here in, in Spokane and starting to ramp up local has been that if we can make three times what we can on a wholesale fee and it'll cost like less than 40,000 to renovate it, then we'll do it. Yeah, given certain numbers and criteria. Interesting with the 40,000. That's like what we would consider like a... Because that's not a lot, I feel like, where you're at. That's like a cos- very cosmetic. It's very cosmetic. Yeah. It's like a good cosmetic, like a good solid cosmetic. Maybe you have to replace cabinets, you know, like nothing crazy. Yeah, I would say it's like a cosmetic with like one large CapEx item. Yeah, yeah. And that's because like you don't want to get tied up in these properties. And I think the whole idea though is like, is this, does it stress you to do that? And I know you, Dylan, I know like your situation, like you can handle this. And so, yeah, like I would do that all day long because that's a huge spread for the like the little bit of money i'm guessing maybe <laughs> out of pocket with acquisition costs would you be like 40 50,000 tops Probably out like of pocket 40 ish grand yeah. yeah so 40 out of pocket to make 75 and say under 6 months like yeah let's go all day long yeah and what's going i mean tying this back to the previous conversation i first looked at these as rentals because they're not in a bad part of town and the cash on cash you know on paper is 35% with conservative numbers mm-hmm. but taking that and you know, can you redeploy that money? Well, my return on ad spends like 800%. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty good. Weighing those two options, one requires more work than the other, but that's a big enough delta, in my opinion, to go for You're the getting three totally. X to pay off. Yeah, exactly. I would think so. I mean, now if your option was you could wholesale it for 40 or make 75, I would just wholesale it. Yeah, true. True. And, and I'm not really marketing it very hard either. So I probably could maybe do that first. Try to get yeah. in there, do that. So yeah, what are our flippers in your market willing to do things for thirty grand, thirty five grand profit? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you got a buyer out there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to find them. Yeah. The other, I guess the uh, maybe a different line of questioning too. Given you're not Dylan and you're not a stud and you haven't been super experienced in this game, say you're like lucky to wholesale one deal a month. Like you're like hell yeah, I got a good wholesale deal this month. I'm hoping for my one next month. You've been doing that for a year. 
you're not super like capital heavy, like you don't got a ton of cash, but you know, you're, you're able to, to survive. Do you do a 25K wholesale fee on this one? Or do you do 75K? My answer there is definitely yes. I feel like if you're doing one a month, your immediate next thing should try to get to two to three and ignore pretty much everything else. Yeah, I agree. And Boom. you're going to get be able to do that with the quicker cash than trying to get like the larger cash. I feel like that's like advice that's highly overlooked because when you are that guy that's doing one deal a month and you're like hoping that you get one deal every month, but it's been consistent, you just don't believe in yourself and you see 75K looking at you, it's hard to say no to that. Yeah, totally. It's hard to say no. But that 75K, you got to remember, could be 60K with some bumps. You know what I mean? And it could be six months. It could be seven months. You're hoping it's four. Like, and so there's so many variables associated with that. When you're not doing volume, it's really hard for me to say to take down a flip. Well, yeah, when you're not doing volume, especially, unless it's like super clean. Right. One thing I'll let me look up, bring up Ari Simply. This has been in the CRM since August of 2023. And we were under contract to buy these. And out of all the objections, this one was he couldn't get his wife to sign because Ohio is a dower state. So even yeah. if it's like, then it's in his personal name. So like she has to sign away her, di- her dower. She's also signing. And that blew up the deal for a while. And so we mm-hmm. actually put in a first ride refusal on these. Like and he was agreeable to that. And it's we're finally turning back around a year later. Did you have to pay for that first ride refusal or did you just get him to sign it? I paid the attorney to file it, but that was oh, it. Oh, you didn't? Okay. Oh, because you were probably under, were you under contract then? You were? I was under contract, okay. yeah, already. So you kind of yeah. had some leverage there. Exactly. Yeah. And the guy that sells was actually really cool about it. He's like, dude, I didn't, this is like the last thing I anticipated to hold up this deal. Yeah. And so we, that was our solution at the time. I just, I almost had written it off. And then he called me the other day and I'm like, cool. That's so awesome, dude. Yeah, That's because so cool. the prices have appreciated you know, since then, since we've done it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Then the deal makes sense. Yeah. We had one of those a while back too, where when the guy first called us, he wanted 300 grand. It was like 2020. And we're like, no way in hell we could do that. <laughs> and then our lead manager followed up with him in like 2022. And he's like, yeah, I remember you guys, like, you know, my number is 300,000. And we were like, I think we could do that now. <laughs> <laughs> the mark, we, I think we made like 40 on it. Yeah. Yeah. It was a good fee. The market had taken off. And then, of course, we were more seasoned, different buyers. Right. So I guess if you are, you know, a, a newbie and you have those in your warm leads or whatever section, they're a couple of years old and they're, you know, maybe re, redo the comps in some of your places because, yes. you know, these might be deals now that the seller just doesn't realize. Huge, yeah. hugely important thing to do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's also why I'm a big proponent of not pushing leads to dead in your system unless you have like a really legitimate reason to do so. Especially if you're doing targeted marketing, like you're hitting out to people that have bankruptcies and leads and mm-hmm. things like that. Really, unless they the property sells or they are just so unbelievably hostile that you can't have a conversation, you should follow up with them at least like quarterly or every six months because you just never know. You put them as a lead for a reason at some point in time. Whether you had a good conversation with yep. them, whether they called you. I mean, they were a lead at some point in time and you probably paid 50 bucks, 100 bucks, two, 300 bucks for that lead. So don't throw it away. And a, a common scenario is let's say, you know, someone's on a distress list somewhere. They're getting contacted by other wholesalers and investors the whole time. And they're like, I want 200,000. And every offer they get in is somewhere between like 120 and 150. And after yep. a while, they're like, shit, maybe this is actually worth, you know, 150. And if you're yeah. just at the right place at the right time, you're going to get that deal. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's literally the whole business, right? The whole industry is having these people that you bet are going to need to sell at a discount at some point, And you just happen to be one that is directly in front of them when they decide to make that decision. Because it's oh, yeah. not like a hard sales kind of business where you can like convince someone to buy your widget. They have to go through that decision themselves. It's probably the largest decision slash transaction they're going to do in their entire life. And you just have to be one that's there when they decide that it finally makes sense for them to do And so. top of mind. So that way, top of you know, mind. Yep. do the follow-ups, you send the, the mail consistently. There's not much to it. <laughs> I, yeah. Like speaking freely. Dude, like honestly, one of the most challenging things that I really have with this industry right now, and especially with like our scale community and different stuff is I talk to people and there's so much money to be made if you're willing to lie and convince people that there's like some super big secret or it's like a really complex thing that only you know the answer to. Oh, yeah. Proprietary wholesaling software. That's yeah. a good exactly. one. Exactly. Some bullshit. When in reality, when I'm just like, hey, look, this business is actually really simple. We just kind of, you know, go over how we do stuff correctly and how we do it in a way that's super easy to scale because it just means doing more and adding in a couple more team members. People are like, Nah, this guy's full of shit. There's no way yeah. it's that fucking easy. Liar. <laughs> that can't work. It can't work that way. 
Like, yeah. come on, guys. It's super yeah. simple. It's so easy. I mean, we literally have like three softwares and a small team and some VAs, and that's it. We have a CRM, a data software, and an e-sign software, and that's our entire business. I bet you we could come with like a new Logan. Like, it's so easy. Even a caveman could do it. Ooh, there you go. Yeah, and then, then we could call it like... See that's still trademark yeah. there, Dan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's that. And then we could call it like house vesters or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we can have maybe trademark. We buy ugly properties. How about that? Let's that's do that's it. That's a good idea. I like yeah. this business plan. Let's yeah, go. I think so. Yeah, we got, we got, we got legs on it for sure. <laughs> cool. All right, guys, anything else to wrap up? No, I think that's it for me for the, this week. Cool. Right on, guys. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. You should share this with your friends who are into real estate business or are trying to figure out what to do with their money. Because we all have those rich friends who, for some reason, have way more money than you and they make stupid investment decisions. Mm-hmm. Tell them to not pour it into stupid rental properties where they're not going to make anything just because they don't want to work. Because that's a bad strategy. So hopefully you can share this with them and uh, convince them to not throw their money away. But anyways, guys, thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you guys next week. See ya. See ya. See ya.